Is this the rarest Chrysler muscle car ever sold to the general public? I think that it is. And for more reasons that are obvious or, or the current talk about this car. To get to this story and how I've reached this conclusion, it's kind of a twisty, turny path. But stick with me and you'll see where I'm coming from with this. So the story with this car, this thing belongs to a channel called Backwards Performance. And on the surface, it's a 3 to 3 four-speed coronet, a 66 3 to 3 four-speed coronet, which in and of itself is not a very particularly rare or desirable car. It's a nice car, but it's not over the top. But there are anomalies with this car. And what I learned about this thing from my friend Gary French. So now Gary is an old friend of mine. He's a lot like me. He likes the rare and the weird and stuff like that. And we haven't talked in a while, and we caught up over the weekend, and we're chatting back and forth, sharing stories, and he tells me about this car in it. And he picks this thing up someplace in his travels, and on the surface, like I said, it's a 3 to 3 4 speed car in it. Nothing special about it. He gets the car home, and he's looking it over, and he decides to check the VIN on it. So he opens the door, and he looks at the VIN number, and... The fifth digit is an H. Okay, so now, 1966, the fifth digit of a Chrysler VIN denotes the engine size. And in 1966, H meant 426 Hemi. Right away, Gary's like, I scored. You know, I actually picked up a, a Hemi car in it for the price of a 3D3 car. But now he decides to look over the rest of the car. And it doesn't have any of the other telltale Hemi things from 1966. It doesn't have the big core support. It doesn't have torque boxes. It doesn't have the pinion plate, you know, the reinforcement plate. It doesn't have the 3 8 fuel line. It doesn't have the relay bracket. On 1866 only, Hemi cars had a bracket with that mounted the horn relay and the starter relay on the driver's side inner fender. It doesn't have any of those things. So it's like, okay, well, it must just be a misstamped VIN. And this happens occasionally. It's, it's kind of a big deal for the, for the fifth digit to be misstamped to show that it's a Hemi car, but it is possible it's done. So just to double check things, he digs through the car and he finds the build sheet. Now the build sheet is the blueprint that the car has, but before it's a car, it's a build sheet. And that sheet is what follows it down the assembly line and the car is built around that. So he takes a quick look at the VIN on it and the fifth digit is a G. So now 1966, and it's a four-speed car. So your only options for a four-speed car in 1966 and a B-body was a 361 two-barrel, which would be VIN F, a 3 to 3 four-barrel, which would be a VIN G, or a 426, which would be a VIN H. Well, the VIN printed on the broadcast sheet, the build sheet, is a G. And that lines up with everything else. And it, and it further backs up the fact that it's just a misstamped, in his mind now, and that's just a misstamped VIN. He sells the car to his friends, backwards performance. And in the process of going through the paperwork and digging out the title and everything else, he takes another look at the build sheet. And the bottom corner of it had been folded over. He unfolds the bottom corner and in an area on the very bottom where it says remarks, it says 426 wedge. Okay, so now it has a Hemi VIN. Well, when I say Hemi VIN, it has a VIN that calls for a 426. And on the build sheet, it says 426 wedge. Obviously, this is a really rare car. So, now I'm paraphrasing a lot of this because if you're really interested in this part of the story, Backwards Performance has covered it pretty extensively on their channel. So you can go and you can watch the videos on this. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this. So, it's clearly a car that was originally set off to be a 3 3 4-speed, and then somewhere along the line, it was, it was pulled off the regular assembly line and converted to a 426 wedge. Now, why is this really significant? They do some research on the car, and they contact Galen Govey, who's the guru of all things Chrysler Historical. And Galen says, yes, this thing was sold through Mr. Norms, 
along with two others. One of them, the whereabouts are unknown. Another one is up in Canada and it's been converted to a Hemi to match the VIN. And then it leaves this one here. So, why is this so unusual and why is this even rarer than it appears to be just with that, a 426 wedge car? And that's because there's no question that this car exists. There's no question that the VIN is stamped in H. There's no question that it had a 426 installed in it at some point. But it could not have been ordered that way through the dealership. Mr. Norms could not have ordered it that way. It had to be done through other channels. Why is this? All right, so to understand that, we have to look at other really rare, one of a kind, two of a kind, or not supposed to exist cars. Now, this is something that's always interested me. When I started High Performance Mopar Magazine back in 1986, I was like a kid in a candy store when it came to finding like cars that weren't supposed to exist and all of that. We found a 1967 Hemi satellite. And it, that sounds, well, what's rare about a 67 Hemi satellite? They didn't build any. The Hemi was not available in the satellite trim. The Hemi in 1967 was only available either as an RO23 car, factory superstocker, Belvedere, or in the GTX. It wasn't available in satellite trim. But we had one there. I actually drove the car. It was in North Carolina at the time. And after we uncovered that one, several others popped up. So we found that it was possible during that period of time, 1967, that if you pulled the right strings, you could get the 426 Hemi installed in the satellite trim. Other rare cars. So at the same time, actually, we did the story on the satellite. And in my column in that magazine, I mentioned that I wanted to find the two four-door Hemi Coronets. A couple of years before we started doing the magazine, Chrysler put out a, a roster of all of the known 426 Hemi cars and that they had built 10,000 and change, like 10,600 of them total. And on that list were two four-door 66 Coronets. So I mentioned it. Hey, I'd really love to find these two 66 four-door coronets. A couple of weeks later in the mail, I get an envelope and it's got photographs in it of the two 66 Hemi four-doors, the red one and the white one. The white one, it's currently in Garlitz's collection and the red one, the last I saw of it was in Bill DeGilio's collection in Las Vegas. I, I don't know where it's been since. So we posted the, we published the story on that. And then stories of other four-door Hemi cars popped up, including a couple of station wagons, one that went to Richard Petty and it was used as a parts chaser, and one or two that were actually the race cars from Word Go. But they were built. Four-door and Hemi station wagons were built in 1966. Now again, that's not really unusual, because at the time now, you've got the bodies coming down the assembly line, you've got your engines, the front suspension, the K-frame, it's all one assembly there. And it's really not that big of a deal if you've got the right pull to say, well, here, take this engine and put it in this body and this trim and send it. Let's look at one other example of this. Um, the 1972 446 pack cars. They built like two Roadrunners and one or two Charger rallies. The numbers escape me. But these are 1972 446 pack cars and they exist. And they're documented. The 446 pack wasn't available in 72. But it was intended to be available. And these were very early production cars. So before they canceled that option on the, on the, the, the 446 pack option, these cars were built, they were pre-production or very early production and they got out the door. But then by the time regular production started, they canceled the option and those cars get out. Once again, not really unusual. It's late 1971, they're building these cars, here come the cars, here's the engine, the, the drivetrain is, you know, on assemblies, just made them together and send it. Not unusual. Then you get to this car. See, the thing about this car, what makes this car exceptionally weird, is that there was no production 426 wedge engine available in 1966. So let's talk about the 426 wedge. The max wedge starts out as a 413 in 1962. 1963, they increased the bore to unshroud the valves, to take advantage of the larger valves, and they go to the 426 size, a four and a quarter bore 426 size. 
to capitalize on the notoriety, the, the drag strip notoriety of the Ford, the Max Wedge, Chrysler produces what they call the Street Wedge. Now the Street Wedge really wasn't anything exotic. It was the same 426 size. It's a four and a quarter bore, three and three quarter inch stroke. But it had the regular solar heads on it. It had a single four barrel. Basically think of it as a, as a small bore 440 Magnum. For, I mean, for lack of a better description. It was not that big of a deal. It was rated at about 365 horsepower. And that was available in the B-bodies. 1963, 1964, 1965. 1966, that's canceled. They're done with these engines and they're going to go to the 426 Hemi. So this is where this situation becomes, becomes very sketchy with this car. And I'm not saying the car is sketchy. I mean the history, the prehistory of this thing is... all right. So, at the time, all those other rare Hemi cars were ordered, the salesman was able to just check the right boxes. And if he had the right pull or whatever the circumstance would be, this was done. This, this could be done on the assembly line, normal assembly line. But that wasn't the case with this car. That engine was not on any of the order forms, could not be ordered. So how did this thing come to be? My speculation is that Mr. Norm didn't order these cars. These cars were ordered internally, and they were ordered internally as a, an insurance policy. Okay, now we have to go to the 426 Hemi. Chrysler bans the Hemi from competition in 1965. So, Chrysler needs to homologate the Hemi by building 500 street versions and sending them out there. They rush this into, into product, they rush this into R&D. Mid 1965, they have street Hemis, like legit street Hemis, the same way we know from 1966 and newer, running around in a couple of car nets. Now, one of these cars was road tested by Marty Shore, an old friend of mine, Marty Shore, for High Performance Cars Magazine in 1965. There's pictures of this thing. It's driving around New York City. The underhood shots show a street Hemi. Not a, not, a, not a race Hemi, crosser or anything like that. It's got a chrome dome air cleaner. It's a street car. It's a street Hemi. But there were drivability issues with it. And remember, the 1966 season is coming up quickly. Chrysler wants their presence back in NASCAR with the big inch engine. And they want the Hemi back there. They have a drivability issue to deal with. Now, here's the drivability issue with the street Hemi. The intake manifold doesn't have any, any provisions for heat crossing with the solar heads and the intake manifold don't have any way to warm the plenum. So if you have a street Hemi and you've got a, a, an aftermarket intake manifold on it, let's say, it takes 10, 15 minutes for this thing to even be remotely drivable. I mean, you start it and, and it just, it'll just, just fall on its face every time you give it gas. Drivability issue. Chrysler solved this with a convoluted heat riser setup. So if you're familiar with the street Hemi, or if you're not familiar with the street Hemi, at the back of the intake manifold, there are two tubes that come off the back of the intake manifold. They go to the passenger side of the transmission and they attach to the exhaust manifold. So the one tube goes straight up to the, to the intake. You've got the passage inside the intake. Then you've got another tube that comes down and attaches behind it. And in between is a, is a heat valve, or a, uh, a flapper valve. So that system is designed to send that exhaust gas up or the exhaust heat up into the intake manifold. It's a bit Rube Goldberg and it was a little hit and miss and the calibration on the early cars was bad so there were drivability issues. Chrysler needed to have the 426 motor represented, needed to have the, the bigger inch engine, something bigger than a 3D3 represented in the B-body cars for the, the 66 NASCAR season but there was no guarantee that the 426 Hemi was going to make it. So it appears to me, it looks like to me, they started R&Ding or at least preparing 426 wedge B-bodies to go out there and take that, that place, sell 500 of them, just in case the Hemi didn't make it. Now, according to the original owner of this car, it had, see right now as it sits, it has car in it, 500 emblems on the front fenders and it has 3D3 four barrel emblems on, on the, the fender, you know, the call outs. 
But that's because this car was wrecked at some point, 1969, 1970, he ran it off the road into a ditch and screwed up the front end. So they took the sheet metal from a 66 Carnet 500 and grafted it on there. And that's why the trim on the front doesn't really match. According to the original owner, who, who the guys at Backwards Performance contacted, the car originally just had V8 emblems. Right? So there was no Hemi callout, there was no 3D3 callout, it just says V8 on it. And there's an interesting parallel, and I'll get to that in a second. And he also said that the engine was orange. Now this is an interesting fact, because if he's right and the engine was orange, it had to be hand built. 19, the 1963 to 65 426 wedge motors were all turquoise. None of them were orange. The max wedges were orange. Now there's another factor too that indicates a hand built off the assembly line package. The oil pan from the 1962 through 65 B bodies is different than the 66 and newer. Because what happened was they moved the engine. 1966, they moved the motor back two inches. And they, re, they redid a few things. So the oil pan is different between the 62 through 65 and the 66 and newer. So to make this package work, they would have also have had to take one of these 426 wedge engines, not only paint it orange, but also install the later 66 style oil pan. It was not an assembly built car. This is not something that a dealer could have said, you know, a salesman could have said, okay, well, you want the 426 wedge engine? We'll check this off and check this off and send the order in and maybe they could put it together. Those things only worked, that maneuver only worked when those parts were available on the assembly line within convenient bolting together space of each other. It wasn't something that they're going to just pull this thing off the line and special hand built this car. So, there is no doubt, there's no question, this car came through Mr. Norms. There's no question it was factory built. There's no question it had a 426 wedge in it. But it was not ordered through Mr. Norms. It was ordered internally, and it was ordered to fill, I believe, an ins it was an insurance policy just in case they couldn't get those 500 units of street hemis out in 1966 for recall reasons or whatever it would happen to be. This was a plan B that would get the 426 size engine on the NASCAR tracks for 66. Now, Norm had put together several package cars over the course of his life as Mr. Norm. And there were the, the 346 pack cars, the supercharged, the GSS cars. He, he did a lot of, of one-off packages, but none of them even remotely came to the level of specialization that this, these particular cars did. And there's another interesting thing about this too. In one of his ads for the 1966 cars, he lists Hemis and street wedges. So at some point, somebody at Chrysler must have said, you know, I've got a supply, I can give you a supply of these cars. So he went ahead and actually advertised that street wedges were available. Now it doesn't say anywhere on there, special built, special order, special anything. It just says Hemis and street wedges available for the 66 car nets. So there's, there's a lot to this. There's a lot to this. Now, an interesting thing about the emblems, okay? Like I said, this car came with just V8 callouts, according to the original owner. Now, there's an anomaly with the Plymouths of the same era, early production 426 Hemi Plymouths, because they didn't have 426 Hemi badges either. They had a badge that said HP2. That's all it was, just HP with a 2. And people have speculated now for almost for 60 years, what does HP2 mean? Because they, no, they never elaborated. Nobody ever explained what HP2 was. And they still don't know what HP2 was. But it shows that early on, very early on, Plymouth was reluctant to put the Hemi badge or the associate the Hemi name with its 426 B bodies. So that's an interesting thing too. It kind of ties into all of this. Now there's one other factor that I've, I've neglected to, when we're talking about VIN, the VIN numbers, fifth digit of the VIN, the engine code. So as I said, F was a 361 two barrel, eight, G was a 3D3 four barrel, H was a 426. But there was another letter that I have yet to see stamped on anything, but Christ left a provision in there for, just for this. And it's a K, 
which is special order V8. So now if this car had somehow or another been ordered from a salesman, special ordered that way from the very beginning, it would have had a K as the fifth digit, but it doesn't, it's got the H. So it appears to me Chrysler prepped, I don't know how many of these cars, just in case, ready to go out, left them un unvinned. Because the VIN is like the last stage. They, they do the VIN when it comes time to create the certificate of origin for the car, and that's what the title comes from. So evidently, they were like, okay, well, we've got these cars. They're good cars. Let's sell them. We'll sell them to Mr. Norms. We've got to put tags on them. We've got to put VIN tags on them. So as they sent them through, they said, well, it's a 426 engine. So that's why the VIN was stamped with an H, and the broadcast sheet shows a G. It's a very interesting car. And if my speculation is right, it's a car that was never intended to be used specifically as, it was never intended to be released as a car, but it was a fail-safe in case the 426 Hemi didn't work out. Really fascinating history on these things. So, Backwards Performance is the channel that has the car, they've done a lot of videos on it, they've been taking it to events and, uh, and showing it off. It's a, it's a time capsule just the way it is. I do hope though that this car eventually does get restored with a 426 wedge and all of the appropriate stuff. If you know anything more about this or anything similar, drop it in the comments because I would love to follow up on this and see if there's more to this story. I think that there is. All right. I hope you guys got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.